go ahead and get this started. Renee, can you admit people? Um, Gladly. Come? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so hi, I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's presentation from Dickinson Live. Um, we have been so happy with the turnout for the series and we'll be continuing to host talks throughout the summer. Um, our next presentation will take place in around three weeks again and um, all the details are gonna be, are still being worked out, so stay tuned. Today, we are hearing from Ivy Schweitzer and Al Salehi with some help from Renee Bergland. So Ivy, as you know, she teaches English and creative writing at Dartmouth College. She edits the Occam Circle, uh, which is about uh, the Mohegan writer Samson Occam. Um, she has published essays on that. She also recently produced a full-length documentary called It's Criminal, A Tale of Prison and Privilege. Um, as you surely know, Ivy produces White Heat, a weekly blog about the year 1862 in the creative life of Emily Dickinson. Her current project is collaborating on a poetry manuscript entitled Emily Dickinson in the 21st Century, Black Lives Matter. Uh, our co-speaker is Al Salehi. He is um, an American of Persian descent. He's the CEO of a biotech company. Uh, he got his BA from UCLA and a degree in digital library technologies from Harvard. And right now he's completing a master's in liberal studies at Dartmouth. His thesis is a manuscript of original poems in dialogue with Emily Dickinson on issues relating to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Al has also authored several uh, other full-length poetry manuscripts, one of which was a semi-finalist for a poetry prize judged by Natasha Trefany. He plans on pursuing an MFA or a PhD in creative writing with a focus on poetry. Uh, he also plays the electric violin and enjoys making people laugh. Uh, and so at this point, I'm happy to turn the screen over to Ivy and Al. Oh. Um, thank you so much, Marianne, um, and thank you for inviting us. Um, I also want to thank Renee Berglund, who is, go is, our, is the third in our um, three-way conversation, and, and she will be reading the part of Emily Dickinson beautifully, so we're, we're so thankful um, that she's with us today. And we're really excited to share this creative experiment. It's also a work in progress. This is actually the first public reading of this manuscript. Uh, we wanna benefit from your deep knowledge of Emily Dickinson. Um, we've selected a, a poems from each of the seven sections in this manuscript. Um, and we're happy to answer all your all questions in the uh, Q&A afterwards, but we wanna dive right into the poetry and, and not say too much now. Um, so Al, would you like to share the screen of the manuscript? So we've decided to share the screen because the formatting of this manuscript is, is, is a little complicated and quite important. Um, what we have, oh, and I'm sorry, should I, I but there's Al, right? Oh, yeah, I, I just want to mention it has been disabled. So the host needs to enable the function for me ah. to be able to do it. Okay, so can I'm we get it. Hang on a second, I'm on it. So back to the formatting, um, you got it? Yeah. Good. So there are seven sections in this manuscript, poetic manuscript that form a narrative arc that goes from repairing the universal to dreaming a better world. Um, there's the, the cover um, of the manuscript. And we decided to, to share it with you because it is kind of complicated. And also we're not gonna be reading the variants in Dickinson poems, which I think are very important in part of the poems, but they're hard to read. And so we're, we wanted to make sure that you could see the variants. Um, so as you, so out, so yeah, can you scroll through and let's get to a page of, of poetry. So I can just illustrate that. So, okay, so here what you see is how we imagine the, the, a book to look. So on the left, um, as you're looking at it, there will be a poem um, by Al, a poem by me. And then on the right hand facing page, there will be one or two poems, sometimes even three poems by Emily Dickinson. Um, 
and we indicate that order by Roman numerals. You'll see Roman numeral one, a United State, and then Roman numeral two and the, and the first line of the first poem. Now, sometimes there's one case in which my poem comes first and then Al is responding to me. And there's a, a few cases in which Dickinson's poems come first and we are actually responding to her. So it's so in that way, it's it's a very um, kind of interesting and 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 uh, and layered conversation. So Al, will you tell us about the Senku, please? Uh, excellent. Yes, the Senku is a short form poetic um, system that I designed, where it's essentially seventeen syllables, three lines, and it merges the Senryu and the Haiku together. It's a meditation, usually on human nature, uh, some form of a social problem. The first line poses the question, the second line attempts at answering it, and ultimately the third line tries to establish a conclusion uh, if one is available. So now without further ado, um, poems from Emily Dickinson in the 21st century, Black Lives Matter. Take it away, Al. All right, so this is from the chapter, Repairing the Universal. A United State. Love shall always be light and light, but hate is heavy, bright with spite. The windows to the world demonstrate hues all swirled around a single hope that always grows, one day to sever all ropes from gallows. An era where we control all delete the ignorant cries of this is our street. Hoping as equals our neighbors will foil all hateful demands for blood and for soil. Malice replaced being torn to tatters by the faith that black lives and all love matters. Blocking insults to injury and adopting a pact to embrace all humanity as a resolute act. For the brilliant day we choose to rise above together, it shall be as one bird of many colorful feathers. Love will always be a messy, maybe flight across unplausible divides. Can we love what we cannot imagine? With two, we recognize love, but love is also many around a table, all hues and generations, embracing the stranger who puts us all on best behavior. Can we love what we cannot touch? Touch me, though we dwell on opposite ends of much breath. Don't let this messiness unmake us, make it matter. Take what I offer, myself singing in windows flung open, doors refusing their jams so we pass through, pass into each other, not passers-by, but passengers in flight, all colors abroad, abreast, unbranded, borderless. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Color, caste, denomination, these are times affair. Death's diviner classifying does not know they are, as in sleep all hue forgotten, tenets put behind, death lar death's large democratic fingers rub away the brand. If Circassian, he is careless if he put away chrysalis of blonde or umber, equal butterfly. They emerge from his obscuring what death knows so well, our minuter intuitions deem unplausible. This is from the chapter, Seeing in Color. Rope burn. Protesting in the streets, claiming a destiny promised by inalienable liberty. Acknowledging we are the descendants of people bought and sold. The decommissioned enslaved, 
who were not lynched. Can I claim descent from you? Can I imagine you into my ancestry, braid our genes in word ropes of DNA? Dignity now abounds. Ground me in what gave you strength, made the way we make God, not the other way round. Floss won't save you from an abyss, but a rope will. Notwithstanding, a rope for a souvenir is not beautiful. But I tell you, every step is a, through, is a trough, sluice, and every step a well. Now, will you have the rope or the floss? Price is reasonable. The racist frame of mind. There is safety in numbers, said the atoms that made up the anchor. Have been unaware of my privileges as white, check. Really unaware of my privileges as a white woman, check. Believe that racism is just personal prejudice, check. Protested that I am not a racist, check. Protested that I know and like many people of color, check. Protested that I have, a black, that I have black friends, check. That I had a black boyfriend, check that I had two black boyfriends, check. That I am a good person, check. Argued that I marched during the 60s, check. That I don't intend being racist and racism is intentional so I cannot possibly be racist, check. Cried and got defensive when friends or colleagues pointed out my racist language, ideas or attitudes or my participation in racist systems, check. Feared when I passed a dark man on a dark street, Check. Did not call out racism when I saw it in friends, family, work, or community. Check. Retreated into myself, my group, my tribe to complain about the complainers. Check. Felt exhausted by the awareness of racism and wanted it to go away. Check. Consumed black culture and felt cool. Check. Got confused and frustrated by the shifting terminology around race and color. Check. Felt checked, cornered, rejected, like a bounce check. Just wanted it to go away and go back to normal without check. Struggle, 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 not to check out. In petto, a counterfeit, a plated person, I would not be whatever strata of iniquity my nature underlie. Truth is good health and safety and the sky, how meager, what an exile is a lie and vocal when we die. From the chapter, Police Prejudice, The Awakening. Shaken and stunned, watching innocents suffer law's cruelty up close. The victims become the heroes. Now, I too am shocked into action. Once on a family trip to Florida at a Howard Johnson's rest stop, we were not served. People lined up behind us were seated repeatedly. My baby brother got bored, romped impishly in the tulips as my little sister and I pointed and laughed. Nothing was said. A giant star of David dangled on my father's chest, catching the southern sun. We waited and waited. My cheeks began burning. Someone finally muttered, let's leave. We never talked about it. He fumbles at your soul as players at the keys before they drop full music on. He stuns you by degrees, prepares your brittle substance for the ethereal blow by fainter hammers further heard, then nearer, then so slow. Your breath has time to straighten, your brain to bubble cool, deals one imperial thunderbolt that peels your naked soul. When winds hold forests in their paws, the firmaments are still. Officers of the Peace. 
the pay raise paid for by taxpayers you harass and disrespect. Your wallet's now heavier than bullets. In future encounters charged with adrenaline while legally immune to laying waste, I pray it's paperweight for community offering you choose to unload. What might police choose to unload to protect their right to chokeholds? Can serve and protect ever be expressed in a chokehold? Can a chokehold ever become an offering? What are they offering when they press knees to throat? What don't they hear in the words, I can't breathe? If you cannot breathe, you cannot say who you are. Tell what you love and hate and fear and dream. What I love and hate and fear and dream is an offering of myself, all the selves offered as we walk our neighborhoods. Police walk neighborhoods they don't live in, love in, don riot gear, wield tear gas and mace pepper spray. Dickinson put mace in her famous black cape. What might police choose to unload? My life had stood a loaded gun in corners till a day the owner passed, identified, and carried me away. And now we roam in sovereign woods, and now we hunt the doe, and every time I speak for him, the mountains straight reply. And do I smile, such cordial light upon the valley glow, it is as a Vesuvian face had let its pleasure through. And when at night, our good day done, I guard my master's head, tis better than the eider duck's deep pillow to have shared. To foe of his, I'm deadly foe, none harms stir the second time, on whom I lay a yellow eye or an emphatic thumb. Though I than he may longer live, he longer must than I, for I have but the power to kill without the power to die. From the chapter, Moment of Silence. Gathered into the earth and out of the story, gathered to that strange fame, that lonesome glory, that hath no omen here, but ah. <laughs> We do not know the time we lose, the awful moment is, and takes its fundamental place among the certainties. A firm appearance still inflates, the card, the chance, the friend, the specter of solidities whose substances are sand. Uh, sorry, in this one, there's a poem of Ivy's that is missing on the page. So I'm going to get it. And yeah, then okay. I'll have Ivy pop hers on her on computer afterwards. Um, for Briona. Unsought fame and sad glory in the ground. What's happening here? Who's in charge? Who's to blame? It doesn't matter how you do it. Amend it. Here are prayers gathering over agitated quicksand. Denied an audience with the new day. And she still dreams alone and in awe. So we implore you, command you, remedy Earth's revolution, arrest the sun from setting, require justice, not the way it just is. So I can't find it. It's okay. I will bring it up manually. That is going to be the fifth on that document. And this way, everyone gets to see the madness in the kitchen. <laughs> so let's see here. This is selected poems. Now this is the original manuscript. I did. I couldn't find it in the original, so it somehow got lost. So. Oh, yes, it has been eviscerated. Oh, no, actually, yes, it has. <laughs> it's not, 
we, we will find it. The, the good news with Google Docs is that uh, it keeps all kinds of versions for you. So uh, we went to the, we did a trial yesterday. And in our trial, we had uh, swapped the order of these poems. Okay, I've got it, so. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read it. And okay, not go ahead. It in, okay? Sure. Okay, sorry about that. Say her name and who she was, a daughter, sister, cousin, lover, friend, that she belonged, longed for, spaces she cultivated, roots she drew from, a network severed too early, but not forever. Say her name and how she valued her time, her calling, holding up others, tending the broken, working under pressure, earning her rest. Then say her reason for being here, her worth, her daily toil, a person, a woman person, a woman of color person, a sold person. And say how she left us at her heart earned rest without warning, shattered, shattered in her own bed without warning, 32 shots wired into her home, six found her sleeping while black. And say why she left when there was no reason not all we have, but rage at her strange fame, not out of the story, but cast into our history's choked grave of glory. Too many persons there taken as less, less than, dogged, treed, strung up, put down, made to wait, made to serve, shot at, pressed into concrete, pressed out of breath, taken away, gathered into the earth, but not out of the story because you girl, are the long tale we must keep on telling. So we must say your name and say all the names, say them until saying becomes praying, becomes kneeling, becomes standing up, becomes shouting out, becomes living free, becomes being able to be a being with all others. Excellent. Uh, let's see, now we move on to the chapter Laws and Lies. Supreme Racist in Chief. I can laugh with you now because I see who you really are. I am unburdened as I have now forgiven myself for misjudging you from before. We can get along at the moment, but I'm in no way disillusioned. I remain focused and careful as I sadly foresee that out of nowhere, like the scorpion that you embody, inevitably, with pronged poisonous prejudice, you will sting. After Asip Mandelstam's Stalin's epigraph, 1933, quote, we live without feeling the country beneath us. We live stunned by the hiss and slosh of lies you have vaporized the ground of trust. I cannot laugh at you, Mr. Narcissist, your leathered hypermasculinity, poking fat fingers into the nation's eyes, trailing a fug of syncophantic cockroaches, spewing the toxins of a runty mind and stunted soul. She dealt her pretty words like blades, how glittering they shone, and everyone unbared a nerve or wanton with a bone. She never deemed she hurt. That is not Steele's affair. A vulgar grimace in the flesh, how ill the creatures bear. To ache is human, not polite. The film upon the eye, mortality's old custom, just locking up to die. The art of the steel. Blood spiked with vengeance, guts packed with rage, hazing awareness, let there be night. Trumping past legends, turns a red page, forfeiting fairness, makes it alt-right. Stealing can be alt-right if enough accept, but quicksand sucks all down. Mine by the right of the white election, mine by the royal seal, 
Mine by the sign in the scarlet prison, bars cannot conceal. Mine here in vision and in veto. Mine by the grave's repeal. Titled, confirmed, delirious charter, mine, long as age is still. From the chapter Taking Action. Staring down the bully. Run away, big bully, run fast. I'm more confident and resourceful, a mouse of stealth and survival, while you hide in an elephant's girth. A frigate bird inflating his red throat pouch, you swagger and bluster, a lumbering warship no match for the agile sloops of progressives. I took my power in my hand and went against the world. It was not so much as David had, but I was twice as bold. I aimed my pebble, but myself was all the one that fell. Was it Goliath was too large or was myself too small? Reprising the universal with the creator. As if in a guided dream, I ask my heavenly father, how will I continue with no currency? He said to me, you only need my word and those who are looking will find me through it. Your brothers and sisters will join you again and you will be together and you will be familiar. They will offer you their radiance. There is no currency greater than this. They will know you through your touch and sound. They will hear my voice through yours and they will remember. For your voice is a result of my breath and my breath is the creator of all things. Don't forget your purpose. Don't forget your way back home. Tell them this whole day at the park is time spent with me. As if in a dream, I hear the man I call my second father, daddy of a family in our building we practically merged with, Brooklyn Jewish version of an extended household. For years, I ran down two flights at night so his wife Hattie, my second mother, could suds my long hair in her kitchen sink. He was a fur flesher, hands big as frying pans, brought home a foxtail he tied to the back of my bike and pinned to my gown when I had my tonsils out, cracked sunflower seeds in his TV chair at night and endless jokes. As a child, I often found myself at the foot of that chair, basking in what I now know was love so unstinting, it lulled the aches of my stretching self. Years later, as his 50-year-old body wrestled with a cancer his brain could not comprehend, he turned to me, lucid as ever, and said, right. The word haloed with radiance and urgent with a last breath. God is indeed a jealous God. He cannot bear to see that we had rather not with him, but with each other play. Far from love, the heavenly father leads the chosen child, oftener through realm of briar than the meadow mild, oftener by the claw of dragon than the hand of friend, guides the little one predestined to the native land. Some work for immortality, the cheaper part for time. He compensates immediately the former checks on fame. Slow gold, but everlasting, the bullion of today contrasted with the currency of immortality. A beggar here and there is gifted to discern beyond the broker's insight. One's money, one's the mine. Novel verdicts on the horizon. I am intrigued by our universe's structure at the center is a massive, no supermassive black hole named Sagittarius A star or Sagra A star for short, a mere 4.2 million times as large as our sun. 
In 2020, scientists put Earth 2,000 light years closer to Sagra A star. Still, we are 25,800 light years away, yet it exerts an enormous gravitational pull on the orbits of planets and also threatens to suck everything into its immense void. An event horizon is the boundary defining the region around a black hole from which nothing, not even light, can escape. Imagine our Milky Way, a br brilliant white arc pebbling the sky like thick cream poured into black coffee and not yet stirred, engulfed by a giant black vacuum, absence of all light. What cosmic story does this tell? What prophecy does this make? Sagittarius is associated with the archer and healer Chiron, who never failed to hit his mark. So seers and prophets are said to be born under this sign. He is also a centaur, half human and half horse. Is this how astronomers, mo probably mostly white, see the Sagra A star, an aggressive emptiness whose power is more slash less slash outside the human, adjacent to the bestial? harnessing the superhuman power of an animal we domesticated to ride us into war, to pull chariots, wagons, and plows, to race for fame and, for, for fame and gain. What healing is here? Ages and ages just circling there, the judge and the jury make bets I'll be back, both just as just and yet both just unfair, one convicted just outside of air, as my inner light flows shining outward in black. Looking forward, it happens a cosmic event, quickly issues a verdict while swallowing mass, a linear process that's equally bent creates a new turn from what came and then went. An opportunity flashes and offers a pass. My future off balance is strung out and hung as a solar blast burst to throw me off loop. The accretion disk shatters while waywardly flung as my record is broken and new notes unsung, the needle spins outward in one violent swoop. A dagger in the dust cuts an alternate course, blocking a fate that I'd live to avoid, reversing my plunge with his immutable force, hence changing the odds for this branded dark horse as two paths diverge in an x-rayed out void. We see comparatively. The thing so towering high, we could not grasp its segment unaided yesterday. This morning's finer verdict makes scarcely worth the toil, a furrow, our cordillera, and our apennine, a knoll. Perhaps tis kindly done us, the anguish and the loss, the wrenching for his firmament, the thing belonged to us, to spare these striding spirits, some morning of chagrin, the waking in a gnat's embrace, our giants further on. Aurora is the effort of the celestial face, unconsciousness of perfectness to simulate to us. From dreamscapes, praying for acceptance. I pray with a modified compass toward an ancient meteorite housed in the ballpark of my ancestral home. I pray a lot, every day, at least three to five times, including any given Sunday. I pray everywhere, in streets, in parks, in parking lots, not solely in godly homes. I pray into the dealer's hands after I have bathed, scrubbing, from below my elbows, above my wrists. I pry my fingers between water and flesh, gliding against the grain like a straight razor to a close shave. I play my purest form for my check-in upstairs. The isma Allah rahman rahim in the name of God the greatest. I pray as an emigrant, you will accept me in the place you have always called home. I pray though my faith in Yahweh, in any God with auditory capacity is severely shattered. I pray most often to a goddess of settling, Shekinah, 
shy, volatile spirit of places. I pray when in motion, loping through neighborhoods, weeding and deadheading, not solely in my plot. I pray in accents foreign to my own ears after I talk to my depressed son. I pry my lips between desire and reprieve phrases that often slip away. I play endless games in my head with my head. Al mole rachamim, shochen bam rumim, hamse menucha enkona al kafe hashkina. God, full of mercy, who dwells above, give rest on the wings of the divine presence. I pray as woman, as white, we learn to greet each other and recreate what home is. At least to pray is left, is left, O oh Jesus in the air. I know not which thy chamber is. I'm knocking everywhere. Thou settest earthquake in the south, and maelstrom in the sea. Say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, hast thou no arm for me? Of course I prayed, and did God care? He cared as much as on the air, a bird had stamped her foot and cried, give me my reason, life. I had not had, but for yourself, twere better charity to leave me in the Adam's tomb, Mary and not and gay and numb than this smart misery. On the horizon of change, one way entry, can't back up reflect, uncharted transition to see. Like butterflies bursting cocoons only to fly across an ocean. My cocoon tightens, colors tease. I'm feeling for the air. A dim capacity for wings demeans the dress I wear. A power of butterfly must be the aptitude to fly. Meadows of majesty concedes and easy sweeps of sky. So I must baffle at the hint and cipher at the sign and make much blunder if at last I take the clue divine. Wild nights, wild nights. Were I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Feudal the winds to a heart in port, done with the compass, done with the chart. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but more tonight in thee. All right, and that concludes uh, this part of our um, discussion. I uh, wanted to take this opportunity and introduce a mentor, a friend, and above all, someone I consider to be family. Um, I have a scholar that is joining us here today uh, named Odile Dewar, and her background is in languages. Uh, she has a doctorate in uh, English language translation, uh, English language and foreign languages. She speaks four languages, uh, Russian, French, Spanish, and English. She grew up in Europe and in Africa uh, and was recently recognized with one of the highest awards that the uh, French government bestows upon a civilian. Um, so she has agreed to be a reader on uh, my dissertation along with, of course, uh, Schweitzer. I'm just humbled to be able to even <laughs> say these sentences and, and have them be real. Um, and she has agreed to join us here today and read a, um, a poem that uh, we have for you. Uh, one of her poems, one of Emily's poems, and then um, she has also translated that poem into French um, after doing some research, we could not find this ever translated. So it may be possibly one of the first translations of this poem that also relates to our collection. And so with that, Odile, uh, please take it away. Can you hear me, everyone? Bonjour. 
Bonsoir. Good evening. Bonsoir. Thank you. Dobry wieczer. Buenas noches. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very humbled. I, I, you know, it's uh, such an honor to be with all of you, to be working with Ali and uh, Ivy on uh, his manuscript. I knew Ali when he was 14 years old. So this is an amazing uh, moment, an adventure into this uh, poetic uh, tapestry that we are all together. I'm not, um, you know, Ali, uh, I can't uh, believe uh, the introduction you gave me because uh, I'm just a little frog on an island here, I tell everyone. But anyway, thank you for inviting me. Merci, Ivy, d'être là. Okay, il uh, y a des Français, il y a des Français ici oh, ce soir? Oui. Oui, Merci. bonsoir. 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 En France. Ça va bien? <rire> ça bonsoir, va bien oui, ça va. Vous êtes d'où en France? Je suis à Orléans actuellement. Ah oui, c'est très beau, Orléans. Voilà. OK. <rire> so, I'll switch back to English. And please, um, you know, forgive me. I'm not, um, you know, such a good reader, but I'm going to try. OK. So, here we are. The, one of the poems I wrote a long time ago, actually, uh, is called America, a land. A land of unknown beauty, a land of love and harmony, waiting to birth life for foreigners who strive. Liberty is a name that shall always remain in the souls of those whose dreams appear in this domain. Uncertainty was fled to renounce thoughts and words unsaid. Hope sailed to open shores to discover skies, fields where to anchor. Mind settled under the Milky Way in God believed in church spread. When anger, fear, despair knocked on doorways, angels appeared in the darkest of days. A land of striking violence, a land of passion and indifference, a land of endless landscapes, a land under my skin forever à jamais. So, I'm, I have a poem that. Um, um, I translated, but again, uh, you know, um, I'm not a professional uh, translator here, so I tried my best. Uh, and the poem is uh, of Emily Dickinson, which is The Lump Burned Sure Within. The lamp burned sure within, though the surf supply the oil. It matters not the buzzy weak at her phosphoric toil. The slave forgets to feel the lamp burns golden on unconscious that the oil is out, as that the slave is gone. La lampe brûle bien à l'intérieur, même si les serres en procurent l'huile. Cela ne trouble point la mèche si prise par son labeur phosphorique. L'esclave oublie de la remplir. La lampe brûle toute dorée encore, inconsciente que l'huile s'est évaporée, puisque l'esclave est parti alors. Thank you for letting me share, and I'm I'm sorry I'm I'm not one of you. You guys are amazing, and I'm just a little frog on the island here. <laughs> Thank you, merci. Thank you so much. I also wanted to say that uh, it's amazing that we can all meet through the magic of poetry, and. Uh, all over the world, and that can change lives, really. And that's why I think that this, uh, you know, manuscript of Ali about and Ivy about Black Lives Matter has touched my heart so much because I think it's going to change people's attitudes too. And I think that's what poetry is about too. Your messengers of action too. Merci, Odile. Um, yes. Marion, can we open it up for discussion and comments or reactions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, if people, if you would like to ask a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and speak it out, please. If anyone is going to, uh, you know, say, how dare we, because of course our poems are nowhere, good in comparison to Emily Dickinson. Yeah, we were I all going to say that, Al. Yeah, sure. I just want to say that I brainwashed Ivy, and I am responsible <laughs> for this. So just take it out on me. <laughs> to the contrary, I, uh, I feel um, I, I, I'm so 
um, grateful. I feel so inspired by what you've done here, the way that you um, uh, just make, like make creativity actually seem possible to me and, and um, uh, just inspiring each voice. And I think, and using Emily, not in a way that we all kind of like bow down and try to ferret out the, the meaning of these kind of gnomic utterances, but as a kind of inspiration for ourselves. I find, I found it, I find myself amazingly uplifted by, um, by the reading that you all just did. I, I loved it. Thank you so much. I do, I have some questions that, you know, I jotted them down as perhaps, you know, the, organi the job of the organizer. So I can and will ask them, um, but um, I was once told that you should, whenever you call for questions, you should always count at least to seven. Um, so I do this, so I'm gonna, you know, I'll put it out there. We can have some silence for a while um, and people are welcome to put out there, you know, it can also be just comments if you don't necessarily have a question. By the way, Odile, you speak French beautifully. It's magnifique. <laughs> <laughs> well, <c> très bien. <laughs> Merci. Okay, anyone? I will say, first of all, um, merci beaucoup. I mean, this is just amazing. I found it exhilarating. It's very timely. I put a short stanza from Dickinson in chat that I started thinking of while y'all were reading. Um, and I just want to thank you so much. Poetry is a wedge into the world. It opens up possibilities. Uh, and I, I just, you know, I am, this has been breathtaking and I don't have bit many words here except for thank you. And thank you for seeing poetry as a wedge, as something that will create opportunities for connections that we might not have otherwise. And we so desperately need them now. I mean, Black Lives Matter speaks for so much in this very broken world. And this gives me hope, so. Um, I am really impressed with this. I have really, um, I'm just overwhelmed. Uh, the way the Dickinson poems went with your poems and uh, the way you hit upon the things that are bothering me. Um, the poem Check, the one that ended in Check, I have a friend that I wanna share that with because he is just, he quit the church because we're concerned with things like uh, prejudice. And, and he says, I'm not prejudiced. The whole uh, thing that's going around, uh, that white people don't know they're prejudiced. I'm, I'm trying to think of the book that we read. <laughs> um, I will, but anyway, I want to read, is this a book? I want to read it. I want to watch it on uh, YouTube. I want to share it with my friends. Thank you. Well, it's interesting, Nancy, that you, you said that because that poem specifically was written after a summer of reading um, White Fragility by Robin. That, that was it, White Fragility. Um, I actually have some problems with that book. Um, and, and the one that I actually like better that I would recommend to people is called um, Waking Up White. Um, by, uh, who is it by now? Um, I forget her name, but I'll, I'll get it. Waking Up White and, and Being in the Story of America. It's, it's so much more humble. Yeah. Um, and it's accusatory. Um, and I think this is one of the things that we as white people need to be doing right now. We need to be thinking about our whiteness. Yeah. And that's the problem. Whiteness is the problem for me. So um, this is, we, this, so <laughs> what we read to you was what, I don't know how many, 50 pages out of a 180 page manuscript. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really quite a long manuscript. Um, and it is a book. I think, Al, we agreed that if people wanted to see it, right? I mean, it's, it's still in progress. We're still working on it. 
that we'd be happy to give if people had Gmail addresses, we would give them the we would allow them to share. Is that how we did? Is that what we decided? So that you know, just email me if you if you'd like to see it, um, or we could just send you you know the little selected poems. It was a little easier to you know deal with because it's not a 180 page manuscript, but we're happy to share it because the point of the poems is to raise consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. really. And as Odile said, it's a call to action. That's the point of the poem. So I'm so pleased that you like that poem. I, I was worried that that, you know, it, that was a very heartfelt poem that I wrote, the Czech poem. And, and it was really about me in the pro process of wrestling with these issues mm -hmm. and, and, and showing myself as not perfect, you know, it's not, you know, or not, not arrived in this woke state, but that, you know, all the things that I'm struggling and wrestling with. So thanks, Nancy. Can you guys say a little bit about how Dickinson helped you um, helped focus your thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement and also how Dickinson helped you find a voice to articulate that? Al, do you want to talk about that? Because maybe this is a good time to talk about how the manuscript came about. Uh, yeah, it was interesting because um, Ivy and I were Originally, we were sharing poems back and forth in a uh, Dartmouth poetry share uh, community that we are both a part of. And at some point, we bonded over some similar ideas, some similar poems, and we started talking in private. And I, I remember um, some of the more timelier poems that I was working on at the time were about you know, Black lives. And uh, Ivy also had um, that she was working on. So we started sharing those. And then she had mentioned that a few of my poems reminded her <laughs> of some, uh, I, you know, since I've spent so much time now with Emily Dickinson, I just call her Emily. Uh, so <laughs> um, she's like, you know, it reminds me of some of Emily's poems. And I said, really? And she started cutting and pasting some of them in there. And it was just a document of just notes, um, brain sharings that was there. And inevitably, it started to grow. And organically, this, this manuscript that became an independent study, that became a thesis that is now here connecting my closest friends and family and this new community of people that I hope to become friends with and learn from and share with, uh, it, it has expanded um, into this. So um, I hope that it is something of value I hope, as Odile would say, it uh, speaks to the eternal and stands the test of time, and that its net effect is one of good. And I would just add to that that, um, you know, as people know, working on the White Heat website, which focuses on the year 1862, has really focused me on Dickinson's thinking around the time of the Civil War. So around the time of, you know, kind of this very public uh, um, reckoning, again, reckoning with racial issues about race and justice. And, and, and it was really important to think, so that, that was really part of the thinking. And, and that's, and Al, we, we went through White Heat together. We, we used white, you know, we used White Heat as kind of a, a kind of teaching um, informational portal. So we were very focused on that year and, and Dickinson's thinking in, in that year. And we really want, and it, you know, it's not about relevance. I think that's kind of a faulty concept. It's not like Dickinson is ever not relevant, um, but it's really the way she, she, as you all know, the way she's able to condense these complicated issues and feelings into, these amazing images that I think was really the, one of the inspirations for me here and, and also for Al. And we really worked hard on each other's poems. We, we workshopped each other's poems back and forth. So it was really a, a kind of collaborative effort. You know, it's in interesting because you, you saw some astrophysics there and the, the concept that we, you know, we were working on is in, um, in 2019, some Russian scientists found a minuscule way to send 
an element of light, a photon back in time that came back again with the exact same signature. So there's a concept and a possibility. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link maybe into the chat uh, to show the, the, the research study. Um, there's a possibility that through this method and possibly other methods of these elements, the theor theoretical elements called tachyons, that you may actually be able to manipulate the space-time theory. Uh, and as a result, several movies have come out on this concept, Interstellar with Matthew McConaughey being one of them, and also most recently, I think last week, a movie called Tenet that Christopher Nolan wrote and directed uh, with inverse objects going backward. Uh, very fascinating things happening. So then, you know, I thought maybe <laughs> we might be able to have these conversations with Emily through Interstellargram instead of Instagram and FaceTime <laughs> instead of FaceTime. And back and forth, we could post and actually have real time poems and conversations about, well, in this particular sense, about this topic. And this topic would be the inception of those black rights, uh, of, of, of black people not being looked at as chattel, started at her time. She was a poet observing that inception. And here we are 150 years later, and I'm saying to her, well, we've made strides, but unfortunately, this issue is still continuing. And uh, I joke with Ivy that I hope someone, through this inverted time process, reaches back to us 150 years from now and says, good news, guys. <laughs> Pigment is no longer an issue. We have, you know, space fungus that's about to end. <laughs> about Antoine? Um, Antoine? I think, I think, thank you. I think Elizabeth was before me. Oh, yeah. Elizabeth, do you want to come in? Sure, thank you. I, I, I just You're wanted welcome. to, I just wanted to, uh, well, I, th that was fascinating. I loved it. Um, and it, it seems as though the the structure that you put together really puts Dickinson and her poems in dialogue with both of you. And particularly, I mean, I loved, uh, as I'm, I'm sure everyone did, the, the, the kinds of nuances and echoes that you had, the alt-right, for example, with putting that against right of the white election. And and because the, the sense of, uh, you know, punning and echo, in some cases it was really strong. In some cases, it seemed as though you were actually working from the same kind of structure, you know, um, and, and then against Dickinson's poems. I'm wondering, in order to enhance that sense of conversation, if you would consider also releasing this as a podcast. I don't know where you are in discussions with the publisher, but, um, for me, at least, it was very powerful to hear them read, and then with Renee as well, just the sounds of the voices speaking against one another was, was almost symphonic. I really appreciated that. Just a thought. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. And, and you're, you're right. I mean, which is why we played around with the for, formatting, because sometimes we, I feel like we're echoing her and sometimes I feel like she, you know, she's, 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 it's better to hear us first and then hear kind of what she does with it, right? And so we're like playing with that space time continuum, you know, as they say. Um, but I, I think you're right. We, um, I think Renee, thank you so much, Renee. You did such a fabulous job, um, you know, being our, being our Emily. And um, I think, I think let's let's think about that, Al, as you know, putting it out in in a kind of auditory, an oral form, an auditory form, a podcast, because I think the voices are really, really important. Yeah, they're very powerful. Yeah, I, I look forward to that. I, I think we live in a time where that is actually easily done. We have so many social media formats and um, also uh, streaming for. Uh, platforms that we could utilize. We'd love to get your help um, and we love to have input to see how we can make this better. Um, and uh, we're still looking, well, we're still working on the finishing touches, but uh, we'd love to see what publisher we should approach and, and how to go about doing that to again, reach the largest number of, of hearts inevitably. So we aim to learn from you. Al and Ivy, 
I'm sorry, um, I actually, was, I think it's Antoine. Yeah, but thank you. But you just said what I was going to say about oh, the, uh, the voicing. I was thinking in terms of call and response and I found it really very interesting that you chose to alternate who came first, who came second, who came third. So it, it, it gave a very nice balance to the dialogue and the conversation. And that's, that was wonderful, thank you very much. I also put in the chat uh, a reference to a translation of the poem you read, Odile, um, The Lamps Burn, and there's only one French translation that I could find, so ah go bon? check it out. Oui, il ouais, n'y ouais. en a qu'une pour l'instant. Je cherchais, je n'ai pas trouvé. C'est difficile à traduire, ouais. Oui. Merci, Antoine, merci. De rien. Yeah. OK, Ellie? I was just wondering if any of the parts of your book that we didn't hear involved Higginson at all, because, you know, her, her great mentor was a great abolitionist and risked his life more than once in the cause. Does he come into it? And can you put him into your interstellar, intergalactic conversation somehow? <laughs> Ellie, that is such a great suggestion. Um, he's in the introduction, of course. So we, we didn't show you or read to you. It's a long introduction where we explain what we're doing. We just didn't want to burden you with that right now. We wanted to just you know, immerse you in the poetry. But you're absolutely right. Now that I think of it, it would be really good to have a letter, to include a letter and perhaps have us write letters in response, you know, to have a, a letter from to Higginson or from Higginson that would be part of the manuscript. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, so thank you, that's a great idea. I mean, I'm putting it on my list. It was wonderful, as everything we heard, wonderful. Hearing the poem, um, Mine by the Right of the White Election, uh, in the context, I just imagined, you know, Donald Trump saying that, you know, right, mine by the right of the white election, and it just has such a ironic feel to it. And then, um, you know, I think Dickinson means something different by it. Do you, do you read the poem in a Trumpian way, or do you think that it's um, somehow standing apart from that? Well, that's, that's, we really laughed over that one. Oh, am I muted? Sorry, we really laughed over that one. I, uh, <laughs> um, when I found it and I thought, you know, and, and I love that poem. And, and of course, you know, as a scholar of Puritanism, I know what it means, but, but it just kind of worked. And, and I, I thought she wouldn't mind us adopting it, you know, to explode his absurdness, right? His absurdity. <laughs> and, and, you know, so, so, you know, and I, and, and I worry that, you know, Dickinson purists would go, well, that's not what she meant. But of course, what we're trying to do here is, is engage creatively in how these poems mean differently in different times and how we somehow embrace the poem. You know what I'm saying? That different mo times and modes kind of, you know, kind of embrace the poem and read and, and the poem becomes something different. It's out there in the world. And of course we, you know, I, I, that's not how I ever read the poem until I wrote this manuscript. <laughs> so it's been a revelation. I see Martha's, Martha Nell's shaking her head. So I feel like I'm on the, I'm on the right ground. <laughs> I wanna um, just jump in to say that, first of all, thank you so much for letting me read because I love reading Dickinson poems. So it's just a great pleasure. Um, but also that one felt bad in my mouth. Um, reading that one in that way, in that context. So I was, I was convinced that there was a bit of an alt-right thing. I, I agree that that's probably not what Dickinson, but it, it resonated in a way that made it feel bad to read, which I say as an endorsement of the project, if that makes any sense. It was uncomfortable. And I think that was an interesting thing. Marianne, are you speaking? Yeah, you may be you know, muted. It could be funny to do it in the podcast, you know, in that voice, that imitating it. It seems like many people can imitate that voice. Not that we ever want to hear it ever again. So, uh, Martha, Martha, Martha. Let's see. I I just want to say, um, I kept thinking also, and I put this up in chat. 
of Claudia Rankine, and it seems that something she said about her own work really fits what y'all are doing. And Antoine's talking about call and response. I had been thinking about that as well. But your work is a song and a summons, a cry and a gathering, one long calling out. And that's so important right now. We all need to be calling ourselves and each other out constantly. It's not a time to sit back and let all be. Are there any other comments or questions people would like to ask? I just, I, I, I had to put the poets like put lamps in, in the chat just because I think that that's, that's kind of self-evident defense of exactly this type of work with Dickinson. Obviously you're creating a new lens for our generation and, and, and I think it's, it's just so valuable and so needed. Totally agree with Martha now. Yep. Well, and Dickinson herself said, a word is dead when it is said, some say. I say it just starts to live that day. And it lives on and on and on through generations. It, it's poetry. Yeah. I was telling uh, Ali and Ivy that they are writing for eternity. This is for eternity, not just for the moment. Are there other things that you guys would like to tell us about, about the book? Just things you would like to share with us? Well, I, I think in any, whenever you're, you're doing a creative project, um, it's, so, it's very emotional. Um, so it's been a very emotional project because you really do have to confront things about your society, but also things about yourself. Um, and, and it's been really fun to go through it with, with Al because we, we have different, we come from different backgrounds and we found so many places in which our, our backgrounds or our, our approaches overlapped. Um, so in the beginning, we, we, have, we have a long note about what the repairing the universal that first section what that title means so in the Jewish religion which is my background we have this notion of tikkun olam to, to repair the world that we are called here and we live on earth to repair the world because the world is broken um, and then in 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 um, Ali's tradition well do you want to tell Al what you what 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 that is in your tradition Oh, yeah. So we have a, um, a very famous poet named Saadi who um, has a poem uh, that starts out as Bani Adam Azai Yektigaran, which, um, which states that essentially we are all part of one united body. And if one part of you is in pain, the entire body must be in a state of unrest. And uh, that poem was a few years ago, uh, 15 years ago or so, put on one of the largest walls inside the United Nations. So uh, I find it interesting that these poets, even from thousands of years ago, had this idea and this notion, and in my opinion, the necessity of unity. Uh, and they put it forward. And uh, honestly, when you look at it from from multiple different sciences, whether it be social anthropology um, or simple biological evolution, what has brought us to this point, aside from opposable thumbs, was the concept of being able to work together, that I may not alone be able to take on the lion, but if I can convince four or five of you to help me out, that together we can actually make this happen and then create a society and eventually move out of the jungle and into civility. So um, I thank you and the ancestors for making that happen. But I hope that we can move even further and actually look at the fact that 
we're not different. We're essentially concepts that are coexisting and that all that really remains from us are our ideas. And um, I just hope to have one stitch in this idea with you guys. And hopefully I'm with you contributing something to that greater tapestry. And I should say about that, that Al and I disagreed and differed in a lot of ways in our thinking about this, right? We've had lots of discussions about the nature of the soul and the nature of the universal and the nature of oneness, you know, and whether our souls are gendered. That was a big, long discussion. And so I'm wondering if people heard those differences between us, because in a lot of ways, we tried to mirror our poems. And, and we took on this similar structure. Sometimes the structures are really totally different. Sometimes the structures are very much the same, but, but then our approaches are different. Um, so I'm wondering if people heard that. Tom, do you wanna? Oh yes, I, I heard it a lot. You, you, the two of you have completely different sense of humor. Um, <laughs> Al revels in, in the pun and you avoid puns like, the plague, <laughs> if I may make such an observation, um, and um, and I you know this runs a little close to home too. But uh, I I, um, I hear the difference between youth and maturity. I, I think I think that really that comes through, um, and I don't I don't mean that as a criticism, Al. It, it's just it's just there, and and it's actually one of the beautiful interactions that we have there. The interaction between um, a, a youth, a, a, a hyperactive youth and a, and a more careful maturity. And I, you know, um, I hope this doesn't sound critical because I, I mean it to sound, uh, I mean it to be, to, to recognize it as one of the good features of, of the project. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it's, it's fascinating. I, I spent a lot of time observing and uh, and trying to learn, and I, I I recently spent a much more considerable amount of time trying to unlearn. Uh, I think that as soon as you set yourself on a track, that track eventually narrows, and you see life in only a certain way. And I'm I am very very envious of human beings who are under the age of ten, because they're just so exuberant. They're running around and they're not running around in one direction. They're actually running around like Tasmanian devils because there is no rule. There's no law. There's, there's no set way to think. And, and if you could somehow harness the power of, well, an over the age of 25 mind, which would be fully developed neurologically into a child's uninhibited, as you say, energy and un, un immaturity. I think that yeah, that would be an intellectual chimera. Um, but if you were to design that, and if you were to allow that metaphor, um, I, I think you would have astounding results. You see, when I, when I see a fork, I see something I can use for a salad. But a child can look at that and, and see an instrument. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I, I see why you're so fascinated by time travel then, because this image of taking the mature 25 plus mind and, and and putting it into the vivacity of the 10 year old. I, I, that can only happen through time travel. You know that, right? Well, no, no, it happens through through practice, the beginner's mind. We, in karate, we call, we talk about the beginner's mind, how to cultivate the beginner's mind. The shoshin, the shoshin. Right. The shoshin, when you do the, you know, Eastern, any kind of Eastern practice, right? Any kind of dough, right? So how, how, how can we, and I think Dickinson really worked towards that um, in a lot of ways, right? So how do, we, how do we cultivate that beginner's mind that always allows us to, to see all the possibilities, see many possibilities and not cut them off somehow? I would like to speculate that possibly, maybe by the end of, hopefully by the end of my lifetime, as that statement that Thomas had mentioned is currently true. I hope that inevitably it becomes untrue because intelligence and memory is actually a systematic set of binary transmission that happens in the brain between these little gaps 
called neurosynaptic fibers. And it's actually sets of lightning bolts that are, act, that are occurring anytime you make a thought. Two parts of different portions of your brain, especially in the medulla oblongata, connect to be able to give you pathways to information that then you access to multiple webs, which we then interpret as something called a collective memory or a self-conscious collective memory. So in that sense, if you can derive that, and, and, I, and I truly believe you can because it's, it's just matter uh, and be able to transfer it, um, I think that young entities can actually be fully developed. And the concept of the chimera just in the last two months has taken up steam, although it is technically unethical and illegal here in America, in other countries it is not. And for the first time, we are growing human body parts of our own in other host cells. And it is fully uh, capable of being implemented. It is, we can utilize it. So I, I think we are steps away from actually being able to test, maybe with not great success, but inevitably something where we can extend and transfer intelligence and perhaps even consciousness. Thank you for that. Dendrites and neurons, right? I know Odile has a poem regarding, um, I think, therefore I am, je pense que je donc. And I know that Ivy je pense has. Je suis, oui. Yeah. yeah. And um, I know Ivy has an opinion on that too, I think, that we talked about once. I wanted to see, I wanted to see what that dialogue is because it involves that consciousness, but I don't know if that consciousness is necessarily a gendered consciousness. Um. Ali has always been very avant-garde, even when he was 14 years old. He was thinking like that already. You were a philosopher very, very young, Ali. <laughs> very, very young. Remember and that I line. See. That line is very thin. Between, <laughs> and I think I have one foot on the insanity side. So be measured with your assessment. Oh, everybody has to be a little bit uh, on the edge. Otherwise, it does not work. Huh? So which one of you thinks that the soul is gendered and which one of you thinks it isn't? Yes, I think the soul is gendered. <clears throat> because it's made from our experiences? No, I, I don't mean that. I, I don't mean that the soul is gendered. I mean that I can't imagine whatever my soul is not having some kind of female consciousness. Yes. yes. I, I just, I can't imagine it. I you know, And it's not like I feel so, you know, totally womanly, you know, not at all, but I, I, I feel like that's such an important part of me that I can't imagine it going away. I, I can't imagine it not being there. I, I don't know. Um, maybe because I feel like somehow the feminine is the, is the or consciousness. <laughs> Can I say that? Yeah. And males are the, you know, kind of the aberration. Um, <laughs> kind of, I, I don't know. I'd love to hear what other people say and and I just can't imagine a gendered soul. It just seems like the whole point of soul is to transcend <laughs> color cast and denomination. Yeah. But yeah. but I kind of I also think that the soul is made up of our experiences. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it exists. I think we make it in that existentialist way. Yeah. So but I still think I just can't imagine it being gendered. If it's gendered, then it has to be colored. Like it has to be racially marked too. Yeah. And like, you know, no. Yeah. Well, no, oh, I see. I yeah, I know, but yeah, but if it's if it's made up of our experiences, that's a profound experience for people. I know, right? But it should transcend those. It should build from those to something that's out of that. But I think, see, but I think my point is that I think it can also it can be it can be marked and also it can transcend at the same time. I think that that's right. You know, saying so it's the kind of feminist both and that you know that we are. Well, it's like if you're climbing a ladder, the the bottom rung is still is still part of the ladder that you're on, so mm -hmm. it's still there. It's what got you where you are, right? Right, right. In a lot of languages, soul is feminine. Mm -hmm. 
in a lot of languages, but I, I agree that it's also should be transcending because it's it's beyond you know gender, of course. But at the same time, there is still this imprint in the linguistic you know uh, culture that it's connected with a lot of feminine you know aspects. But I see both of your points actually. Yeah. Well, that's why I want to that's why I want to make it the both that you know say that we can actually hold both of those ideas in you know at the same time. And that's, you know, that's what's wonderful about feminist thinking is that it, it doesn't have to resolve the paradoxes and the contradictions, it can, it can embrace them. And um, so anyway, I should, I should also say that Odile had the wonderful idea of, um, of maybe translating this, the entire volume, the entire I manuscript. I don't know about the entire volume, but certainly some, well, yes. Maybe. And, and 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 so so that it can have a kind of multilingual life, yeah. you know, that we could kind of get it out in you know to France and to other francophone nations. Yeah, I have a I have a lot of friends right now in Senegal too, and uh, who are very interested also because I'm also on the board of the United Nations, and they're very interested in having like poets like like you and people like you share things which have to do with. Um, you know, the, the sustainable goals for the UN, for instance. And they were speaking, of course, of Black Lives Matter because it's such a important, an important, you know, matter right now. But beside that, other poems too. But I think this, uh, I've been speaking to, to my board actually about having an event about this. And they told me, oh yes, absolutely. And invite other people to, to, to get into that event about uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, how people are feeling. I have a, young people in Senegal right now who are going to be writing in their school. Uh, how does it feel to be, you know, an, a young lady, for instance, in Africa, in Senegal, in the 21st century, and relating to what uh, Ivy and also Ali have been writing in their manuscript. So I think it's, it's so exciting. And, and I just want to thank all of you and thank Ali and Ivy so much for involving me into this you know, adventure for me, you know, I have had a lot of things happening in my life the last few years and uh, it's just bringing me hope, hope for the world. And, and when I see all of you poets, you know, I'm, I'm like mesmerized because that's what life should be about. It should be about reconciling people through beautiful art and not dividing. And that's, I think, the, the ultimate goal. So thank you for letting me be here today too. I really appreciate it. I want to echo that. I have, and I realized listening to this talk, it made me aware of just how beaten down I feel like I have become. Like my brother-in-law, who just died, he's a smart guy. He like he believed that like the the election was stolen. Like I, I'm like speechless. Do you know what I mean? I'm like I'm speechless about our our world and truly beaten down. And so like listening to your poetry, reflecting it channeling it through Dick and Emily and kind of making something positive and not just positive, but also just like the fact of claiming a voice and mm. speaking feels positive to me. It makes me feel less beaten down. That's, mm. that's what I want to say. And that, that's like, I didn't, I wasn't aware how, how beaten down I felt. <laughs> well, I understand. I mean, this has been giving me so much raison d'être, you know, and I think it should give everybody a raison d'être. And that's what we are all about. Yeah. We're, we're all branches of the same tree. So regardless of our culture, languages and colors and you know religion, it doesn't matter. We're all branches of the same tree. And uh, yeah. this is like... Yeah. It's tikkun. And I think that you know, besides translating this in French, it should be translated maybe in Spanish, uh, German, I mean, all the languages it could be translated in because it's really a very, very powerful, you know, message and, and the poetry is, is beautiful. I cried so many times reading both of your poems and sometimes I was so taken into this, um, you know, uh, tapestry that I, I even did not know who was Emily or you guys. I mean, I was like, uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I was I was taken I was really taken into this. 
Well, that's so sweet, Odile. We, we, we so appreciate your input and your support and your enthusiasm. Um, I, I have to say like Al, I, when we first started to read this, I. I, you know, I, I love our poems and, and we, we're, we're working on them and they're a work in project, progress, but reading Emily's poems, it, it, you just, and especially hearing Renee read them, they're so, they're so difficult and, and they, they slay you. I mean, they really, they slay me. They're, they're you know, when, when the smart misery, <laughs> when I, I get to that line, I'm just, I, I just want to go, oh my God, that's just, how did she write that? How did she come up with that? This smart misery. So I, I, it has just given me, it has just increased my appreciation. Working so closely with these poems has increased my appreciation of Dickinson and also of the Emily Dickinson, um, the digital archive, because that is been, if you noticed, we didn't put F or, or J or, or C numbers on the poems because we really want people to go to the manuscripts and look at them. And I went to every manuscript of every poem we, 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 of Emily that we quoted and I transcribed that poem from the manuscript myself, right? Al knows because I was crying about how hard, I mean, it wasn't hard, it was a labor of love, but it was, it was, a, it was you know, but because the manuscripts teach you so much about what's, what, what's going on in those poems. So I, I highly recommend that. There's a part that I was leaving out. Um, <laughs> you see, I, I have I deal in multiple fields, and one of the fields that I work in is intellectual property. And um, the thing that is important here is uh, something can be virtuous and good to begin with, which is this. But inevitably, when it maybe become popular, you have to make sure everything that you're doing is correct and legal because one one area that you may cross the line especially with copyright violation you lose everything and may and you may no one may be able to at that point see anything so when we did our research we found that uh, so many of these fascicles at least the photographs of them had been copyrighted and then later that copyright had transferred to the houghton library at harvard uh, and apparently it's very difficult to get them to offer you any rights at all, much less to all these poems. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I am an idea man, but I also identify talent and I do not have the talent that Ivy does. And she's you know, a very talented person. So I looked to her and I said, look, Ivy, <laughs> I need you to use that eminent, that poet's brain and that Emily Dickinson knowledge that you have to really look at this in a scholarly way and find a way that we can make certain uh, changes to your interpretation of those photographs from those fascicles so that that interpretation is novel and we use those and we are no longer under any form of scrutiny from that copyright or at least in front of some form of a magistrate we have an argument to our defense. So at this point, I'm going to officially call this meeting to a close. Um, I'm gonna leave the, the Zoom open if people wanna chat. Um, it's kind of like if we were at a conference, we could go up to the conference table at the front of the room and talk with the speaker. Um, but um, I, think, I think we're officially done here. And I know that I, for one, am just like, I got a little bit Zoomed out here. So um, here we are. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Odile. Hooray. Well done. It was a beautiful, beautiful event. Happy weekend, everyone. Thank you to all. Merci. Au revoir. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. Have a great day. Ali and...